Club is one of my favorite events of the year. Um, and I'm really excited to be talking about FS2 again. Um, today's talk's a little bit different than maybe some of the, the normal talks I give on FS2. Um, normally when I, when I do an FS2 talk, we talk about streaming or concurrency or some, some new complicated uh, you know, concurrent data structure we, we've come up with. Um, and today I really have a different goal. I, I have really two goals uh, of today's talk. Uh, first is to you know, put a bit of a spotlight on one of the simpler data, data structures in FS2, uh, the chunk data type. Um, it's super useful. It's, it's useful in, in cases that maybe aren't related to streaming, uh, but certainly has been informed through a long design process uh, since really about 2013 or so. You know, and as a result, um, maybe has some interesting things there. Uh, the second goal of my talk today is to really think about that design process, right? Uh, is to look at how a seemingly innocent data type, a seemingly simple data type, has evolved quite a bit over the years uh, in response to, to various uh, stimulus. Um, so let's just uh, jump in. A, a chunk is the core immutable uh, sequence that's used throughout the library. Uh, so if you look at the Scala doc for chunk, or actually if you did this before I started to prepare for this talk, uh, you'd find the definition here, uh, that a chunk is an immutable strict and finite sequence, and that it supports efficient index-based lookup, right? Um, index-based lookup, you know, being like, let me just jump a, a, to a specific index and pull a value out. Um, maybe the, the most performant way to use a chunk could be while loops, you know, iterating through the elements in any direction or, or doing total random access. Um, that was the definition of chunk a few months ago. But that definition is sort of lacking, right? Um, earlier, uh, Rafal showed us um, that really this is a vector, right? That, that vector really is an immutable strict finite sequence of values that has, um, you know, decent efficient indexed base lookup. And in fact, in early versions of FS2, back when it was still called Scala Stream, vector was the, the mechanism internally used to move values around through streaming processes. Right? Uh, I, I had used Scala Stream at the time to do a lot of processing of video and audio data, where we'd have streams of, of you know, content coming in off of the network and doing a you know sort of like real time analysis of or, or soft real time analysis of, of various properties about these video and audio streams, and when doing memory profile uh, and, and and garbage collection uh, pressure profiling, uh, we often found uh, lots and lots of constructions of tiny little vectors. Um, so so <clears throat> there was some opportunity to change the internals. Um, but before I get into those details, uh, I want to show some, some, some quick examples of what the API looks like uh, when, when working with networks or files or um, otherwise getting uh, access to streams of primitive data types. So here are two uh, uh, simple capability traits that ship as part of the FS2 I.O. library. Um, if you haven't used the FS2 I.O. library, there's tons of cool stuff cross-platform, thanks to um, some heroic efforts from Armin uh, Bilge. Uh, uh, to, to port a lot of this stuff to Scala.js and to the Node ecosystem. Um, but overall, we have these capability traits. And these traits provide us the, um, the ability to get streams of primitive values, right? So here, the socket trait, you can imagine getting a stream of all bytes from like a TCP connection, right? right. Uh, if you have a file system, you can imagine streaming all the content in from like a, you know, a terabyte size file, something like that. The types here are the telling things, right? That, that in each case, we have a stream that evaluates effects of type F, some parameterized F, and gives us elements of byte, right? They don't give us elements of like byte buffers or elements of vector of byte or byte arrays, um, but really we wanna, we wanna keep our stream algebra uh, in terms of the uh, most primitive internal data type, the, the byte. So that way, if you said like, well, I need to, you know, I've got some binary protocol and the protocol says that upon getting a message, I'm going to have a frame that's 18 bytes. 
Well, I want to be able to use the take operation on that stream to take those 18 bytes and then process them and decide what to do next. So sort of from a design constraint perspective, we said streams have to um, have this internal ability to move around collections. Uh, and that's why I said, uh, when we first started doing prototyping with early versions of Scala stream, that internal vehicle for moving data through a process uh, was a vector. Um, and vectors are great. Like vectors are, are a great general purpose data structure, but uh, especially at the time, there was some trade-offs that uh, led us to, to some, some innovation. In particular, um, those small vectors I talked about, lots and lots and lots of tiny little small vectors, um, ended up being uh, rather uh, expensive from an overall performance perspective. Um, here I, I use Spark's uh, size estimator just to get like heap size of an object or, or an estimate of the heap size of an object. Um, and then, you know, from left to right, we have chunk sizes or collection sizes. So an empty collection, a collection of one element and so forth up to 10,000 elements. And what you'll notice is that the 213 vector rewrite made a huge difference, first of all. Like in particular, look at the singleton element, the, the, the third column of the chart. When you have vectors of one element, the 212 vector roughly was taking 216 bytes of heap. Um, whereas the 213 vector is, you know, a, a fourth of that. <clears throat> um, but also notice, you know, arrays just, just kick everybody's butt. Um, and some of this is because of primitive arrays, right? If we allocate an array of bytes, um, we're always going to be, you know, a quarter of the size than if we allocate a, a vector of bytes. We need that primitive packing, that specialization. Um, and we'll talk about, you know, chunk as, um, as we go on, but notice that chunks, uh, you know, heap size is fairly competitive with ar array. I mean, really, it ends up being just a, a small constant factor on top of the size of, of a densely packed primitive array. So that was really important, right? Because we move bytes around a lot. So we can sort of augment our definition of a chunk and say, it's not just that it's immutable and strict and finite, um, and that it has a fast apply method. Um, but we also want to be memory efficient for both small collections and large collections. Um, and we want to avoid copying, you know, when it's reasonable. Like when we're moving stuff um, uh, out of like an I.O. library, the way we just saw with files and, and sockets, um, we want to do our best to sort of reuse the buffers that are available with all those densely packed uh, bytes. So let's see how this ends up manifesting in Scala. Um, you know, here we're using Scala 3 indentation-based syntax, which is awesome. I love it, um, especially when we're, we're uh, putting code on slides because you can fit more code. Um, okay, so a chunk is finite. Uh, so right off the bat, we're going to say, we're going to define a size operation and we'll return an int. Um, we don't necessarily need to worry about, uh, you know, chunks that are so densely packed that they don't fit into you know, an int, right? Like a, you know, terabyte file or something. Uh, because we have a streaming library, right? And our streaming library will let us move those finite chunks that are huge, perhaps, um, through the overall computation. We're going to have that efficient random access operation, right? Just going to do a, an index-based lookup. Um, and we have to make some trade-offs or design decisions right away. If we're going to make this random access efficient, and we want it to be useful with like while loops and, and, and so forth, we probably don't want to return an option here, right? Um, especially if we're talking about, you know, working with tons of binary. Um, so we're going to trade off a little bit of our totality, a little bit of our safety that maybe a, a normal API would get um, in exchange for uh, throwing ex exceptions when the index is out of bounds. <clears throat> we're going to say that a chunk is memory efficient by actually providing multiple implementations of our trait for different sizes. Right? We can have a shared implementation in the empty case, you know, a chunk of nothing um, that's just shared across the board. Uh, we can have a singleton implementation that you're only paying for the reference uh, to the one element um, that, that we um, you know, are wrapping. 
And likewise, we can have an array-based implementation that just delegates directly to an array. And in fact, that chart I showed earlier that you know, showed Chunk is, is competitive with arrays is really just something like this. Right? It's a, a small wrapper on top of an array, but um, the, the real heavy lifting there is all just delegated directly to it. And again, we have to make a design trade-off here. Um, we want our Chunk to be immutable, but we take this mutable array as an argument and so if we were to defensively copy that, we're immediately going to uh, violate our constraint that said we wanted to avoid copies. Right? So again, we're going to trade off a little bit of safety for performance. Um, some other examples of avoiding copying would be, hey, if you already have a vector or, or some other index sequence, something else that has a, you know, an efficient index-based lookup, let's just use it. Let's just delegate to it. If you have a byte buffer, because you're working with like Java Nio, same thing, right? Let's just use it. And in this case, by the way, if you haven't worked with the byte buffer API, um, that's good, don't. Uh, it, it's um, pretty difficult to, uh, to work with. But if you, um, if you haven't, that duplicate there is not copying underlying data. That's just duplicating sort of a view on the underlying buffer. Now, if you've done a lot of JVM level performance tuning, you might be wondering, like, we're introducing all of these subtypes of this trait. So like, are, are we at runtime going to end up with some, some, um, some type of like megamorphic dispatch? And the answer is absolutely yes. Um, that's a, a trade-off we're making for, <clears throat> for this application. And we've tuned it based off of that. All right, um, let's see how maybe some of these properties influence other API decisions. So let's say we've got this huge chunk, again, some, some enormous file or something. Um, and you can imagine someone maybe wanting to, to parse like a header out of that chunk and then based on something in the header, you know, parse the remainder or something. And so at, at first glance, you might see code like this, right? Take the first 10 bytes, we get some prefix, do some processing with the prefix, and then move on to the suffix. Um, and a naive implementation of take and drop would you know, uh, I mean, take would be fine. It would just take those first 10 elements, but that drop um, would end up copying the whole remainder of, of that huge chunk. Right? So we want, we want structural sharing the same way, like all of uh, our, our decent immutable data structures have. Um, and furthermore, uh, this particular pattern when working with chunks of processing, you know, beginnings and then and delegating more work until later shows up quite a bit. So we have operations like split app Right, where we can do the operation once and sort of um, get constant time uh, implementations for both the prefix and the suffix. So how do we do this with the data constructors we've shown so far? Um, and the answer is we can't. Uh, we introduce a new one. So here, this is one of the core subtypes of chunk in the library. Uh, it's called array slice, and it references an underlying array and just you know, maintains a view over that array. Um, nothing really that interesting here, right? Uh, the apply operation is just going to do some bounds checking, uh, and the split app operation is really going to just share that underlying values array uh, and just you know, change the offset and the size parameters so we uh, get the prefix view and the suffix. Right? And so in this way, we're able to get full structural sharing of the underlying array. Um, we just have to make sure that that values array isn't sort of accessed directly. Because right? we do want to want to keep this immutable. Um, so we don't want someone to be able to grab that values off the case class and go and change values inside of it. And as long as we sort of clean this up a little bit and, and make those things private, we end up with this uh, constant time split out. All right, let's take a look at a couple other simple combinators. Um, we said we want while loops to be really fast, uh, but we can also uh, define you know, the, the iteration pattern across all elements just using a, a standard Scala for each. And we can implement that in the trait itself as a while loop you know, starting at index zero and just ripping through um, all of the elements. Um, this is safe to do in the trade itself because of that guarantee that apply will be efficient. Right? That's the key point. Likewise, we can have for each with index. Um, same exact idea, right? Just pass the index each time through the loop. 
How about um, map, you know, a functional programmer's favorite combinator? How might we implement map on the chunk tree? <clears throat> so maybe as a first attempt, we do something like this. We say, create a new array of type B, um, allocate it to the size of the current chunk, right? Because we know map's not going to alter the structure of our chunk. It's going to end up with the same number of elements. And then just use that for each with index we just created to assign the result of applying each element to that function f. So now we have a, a populated array. We can just wrap it in the chunk.array constructor, and we have a chunk of b. But unfortunately, this doesn't work. Um, the issue here is that you cannot construct arrays in Scala uh, for an arbitrary type, right? for an abstract type parameter b in this case. Um, the array constructor requires a class tag in implicit scope. So how can we fix? Um, the first answer is anytime Scala complains about a missing constraint, we just add it, right? Just mechanically add it as a dependency, as a parameter to the function we're working on. Um, so in this case, we added that class tag constraint to the type B, and everything works. This is great. I changed the name from map to map compact, though, because I don't want to pick up this class tag constraint as part of the signature of the operation called map. Like mapping a chunk shouldn't require any parameter other than the function that I want to map with. And maybe that's debatable, but certainly when I go to create like a functor instance for chunk, I don't want to parameterize that functor instance by the ability to like have some, you know, class tag appear out of nowhere. And in fact, I can't do it. I physically cannot make that compile. Um, so it's okay to provide this operation map compact, which has a class tag constraint, um, but it's no longer map. So how can we keep the signature of map right without um, without compromising on any of our design constraints? Oh, and, and by the way, um, map compact doesn't actually exist in the library. Um, and there's really a bunch of reasons. Um, the first, and maybe it's the one that like jumps to our mind the, the uh, most immediate, is that like, well, um, we've got specialization, at least in Scala 2. <clears throat> um, but unfortunately, function 1 is not specialized for byte. Uh, and so really, you know, we can demo things with chunk of int, and we can write micro benchmarks that show chunk of int performing really, really, really well. Um, but chunk of byte is really the one where a specialization would pay off. Um, and so because it's not specialized for all primitives, uh, there's, there's a limited value, let's say, in map compact. Um, but really, that's a bit of a weak argument. Um, that's, that's just a, a, a little piece of it. Um, the bigger argument is really the following. Um, the first is that these class tag constraints, if we start adding them to the combinators in our library, will virally propagate up our call stack, right? Really all the way up to the point where we have a concrete type. So anything that's working with chunks in a parameterized fashion is going to end up picking up these class tag constraints. It doesn't sound so bad, but if you go and actually make a change like this and then like try to compile FS2, and start working through the, the errors you get propagating that, you'll see it just propagates everywhere. Um, so the propagation uh, factor is somewhat annoying. Um, maybe more so, though, like now if we did that, we're going to make users of the library have to choose which function to call all of the time. right? Every time we go to map a function over a chunk, they're going to have to say, well, wait, do I really care about performance in this case? which I can use, or which, and, um, and then which I should call map compact? Or is it OK in this case that I just use map? Right? And that's too much of a, of a cognitive burden on folks. Um, and then finally, this approach of like you know, just arbitrarily adding this class tag just doesn't scale. Right? We cannot go and say every operation on chunk that may need to do array allocation um, gets an alternative compacting operation. Right? That's too much. Uh, so here's what we do instead. So, um, so uh, we did get a question in chat, uh, which I don't know the answer to, which is, uh, does anyone know why miniboxing didn't pan out? 
Oh, I don't have a great answer to that, but I think it was, my guess is that it was lack of interest um, you know, by the, the folks pushing it. And the folks that were working on it sort of moved on to other things, as far as I know. But, but um, yeah, maybe we can talk about that later in the Q&A. Um, okay, so here's how we implement map for real. Um, we just create an array of any. Now, this seems terrible, right? How can this work? Aren't we gonna get array store exceptions and so forth? Uh, no, this is, this is actually completely fine um, on all of our target platforms. Uh, we create an array of any. Uh, this is now going to be an object array. Um, so we have this boxing penalty. But again, remember that function one is not necessarily, I mean, or is not specialized on a bunch of primitive types. So we're gonna be boxing things anyway, just as a result of going through that function f. Um, so that we can take the boxed result coming out of that function f and store it in this underlying array of any. Um, this is legitimate and safe only if this array, this internal ARR variable is never referenced as an array of B. Okay. Um, and actually I see from the chat, this is the same trick that's used inside array list. Absolutely, right? Um, so that array must be kept private. That's, that's one of the key elements here. But as long as it's kept private, it's never referenced as an array of B, um, this is totally legitimately safe. Okay. Now, there are times where we need that compacting behavior. Where we, we want to do some operations like map a bunch of things over a chunk, but we want that primitive array backing everything. In which case, we can just add that as a separate operation, which is completely orthogonal to all the other operations on chunk. Right? So here we have a, a function called toArray, which allocates that array using a class tag constraint, um, basically saying like the only time you're going to, to, to have this class tag constraint show up in your signatures is when you're explicitly calling to array or you're compacting. Okay, how about filter? Uh, filter is similar to map, right? We're gonna apply every element in the chunk to a, a predicate. Um, we're just gonna use the predicate to determine whether or not that um, element ends up in the output. So filter is very similar, uh, but we're, instead of allocating an array, we're just going to use a mutable array builder. Um, we're gonna use the same trick Right? Array Builder internally uses the same trick. Um, so we're going to allocate an array of any, uh, give it a size hint, and say, like, hey, we're going to assume that for the most part, when folks are filtering things out of chunks, um, they don't filter everything. Right? Like that, that on average, the output chunk size um, is closer to the input chunk size than, than zero. Right? So that's a heuristic. It may not be right. Um, but then, you know, we'll just run through, um, add all the elements to the array builder, and then um, call chunk.array on that built-up array. Uh, and array builder, by the, by the way, when we call b.result here, array builder will say, oh, um, there was more space in this array, uh, in, the, in our underlying array than we needed, so we'll um, you know, do an array copy. And, and the array you get back is, is uh, just the number of elements you added. All right, um, so combinators are going okay. Um, what about like an append combinator? So let's take a look at this example. We've got another huge chunk. Um, maybe we have a tiny little chunk, in this case, a, a chunk representing a carriage return on a line feed. And the question is, should we add this like plus plus operation to chunk? If we did, then we're gonna to have to handle this case where, you know, huge is like this densely packed array of bytes. And then we've got a tiny little array of bytes and we don't wanna do a big copy of all that data. Right? Um, and so really, you know, these two examples on the dis, you know, lines four and five, the discourage versus encouraged, is that when working with the stream library, we really want people to do the latter, right? We wanna say like, hey, you can append um, a huge chunk to a tiny chunk in constant time using streams. You don't need to append the chunks together. And so the way in which we at least used to, uh, to, to influence this decision is that we wouldn't add the plus plus operation, or we didn't add the plus plus operation to chunks, right? 
we are programmers. We are lazy by nature. We do not want to write code that has, uh, you know, a lot of indirection. Um, and so the operations that we don't want people calling, we just make difficult, right? This is like the await.result pattern from Scala Util Concurrent. Uh, so here we just said, if you want to concatenate this, these, you just have to put them in a list and then pass them to the concat operation uh, on the companion object. That's enough of a speed bump from a design perspective that, that stops people from sort of uh, doing the non-performant thing by default. Let's look at that chunk.concat operation. Uh, so here, again, we're gonna have an, a, a class tag constraint because we're gonna create a, a final array of type A. And in this case, we want it to be a primitive array. And slate path. Um, and then we can just run over the input elements, right? Um, add up all their sizes, uh, allocate our array, and then just step over all of our chunks, um, adding them or, or do, really doing dense copies of those uh, internal arrays into the target array. And there's some details here because of our array optimization. We have these array of any's that I'm not going to get into right now. Um, but for the most part, this is how it can, uh, can cat. So cool, uh, let's try to use it. So here is a sample pool from FS2. So a pool, if you haven't used it, is sort of like a recursive way to create a stream. And I'll walk through this example um, fairly quickly. It's not too important. So if you get lost, don't worry about it. Um, but here we're gonna write this pool called uncons n. And what it's going to do is pull elements from the source stream S. It's going to pull up to N of those elements. And when it gets N, like it, you know, so we pull five elements from a source. When it gets those five elements, it's going to return them as a chunk of size five. And then it will also return the remainder of the stream that hasn't been processed, right? But you could continue pulling on. So again, imagine this is a, a socket. Maybe it's the first five bytes that come into the socket, come out as a chunk. And then the rest of the socket, right? The ability to continue to read from that socket ends up as a remainder stream. So like I said, these, are, these pools are typically implemented as recursive um, uh, functions. And so here's how this one is implemented. We have this recursive helper function called go. And what go is going to do is accumulate a a uh, FIFO chunk of, I'm sorry, FIFO Q of chunks up until the point where we've reached the target size N. And once we've reached that target size N, then we'll you know, compact that Q into a single chunk and emit it. <clears throat> we pull on the source stream S and this S.pull.uncons operation is going to give us um, the next chunk of input elements from our source. So we get and we get a chunk um, as long as the source hasn't been exhausted, as long as we haven't run out of input. Um, so if we have run out of input, meaning we've reached the end of the stream, then let's just emit the concatenation of all of our chunks that we've accumulated. Okay. If we haven't run out of input, then we've got some, some logic to do, right? <clears throat> if, um, if we've reached enough elements, then we want to do that same thing, you know, concat the... Uh, the new element with everything that's been that's uh, left, and then emit it. And if we haven't, then we want to recurse and, and pull the next element, you know, accumulating. Right. So don't worry about the code here too much. But that's the general idea is to accumulate a bunch of chunks. Okay. And again, just like before, this doesn't actually work. Um, and it doesn't work because those concat calls are going to require that class type constraint. And we have the same set of trade offs we had with map. Like, do we make that class tag constraint, a parameter of the uncons n operation. That's one option. Um, but then that's going to propagate. Uh, we, can, we can change the game, right? We can move the goalposts and say, uh, we don't need to concat. And I think sometimes, again, as programmers, we forget we can do this, right? Like sometimes the answer is not solving the problem that's facing us. So in this case, we had like two cases throughout that code. I know I went through it quickly, but we had two cases where we had to concat a queue of chunks into a single chunk. So maybe just don't do that, right? Maybe we just return our queue of chunks directly. Uh, so that's an option. 
And then option three, and for unfortunately for me, this is the option we went down a long time ago. Let's just figure out how to uh, use smoke and mirrors to remove that class tag constraint from concat. So how could we do that? So we have this operation here called concat tagless. Um, and one, by the way, and um, this first implementation is just the same as map, right? We allocate an array of any, we don't let that array be accessed. This works fine. Unfortunately, like chunk.concat is one of those operations where we do actually want that underlying primitive array, right? If you concat a bunch of um, byte chunks together, you really do want an array of bytes backing it, not an array of objects. So while this technically would work and would solve a lot of our problems, it is going to be wasteful. And then if we instead added a dot compact call to the end of that um, you know, concat call, now we've traded off some other performance because now we're going to be allocating this big array, sticking all these boxed bytes into it, and then immediately allocating a, an array of the same size, but this time an array of bytes and moving all that data. So neither of those two solutions really work in this case. This is the one that we did that I regret. Um, we basically used a bunch of heuristics to try to come up with um, a, a, a way in which concat would be fast most of the time. And so the general logic went like this. When you call concat, it would say, well, if I know every chunk in this input sequence only contains bytes, then I can actually delegate to a specialized version of concat that takes a class tag. Right? Here I, I renamed it to concat tagged, but like the, the implementation we just wrote all a minute ago where we took the class tag and just directly allocated an array, um, that's all this is. So this critically hinges on, can we really ask in an efficient way, does every chunk in the input sequence only contain bytes? Um, and then, you know, if, if there's conditions where like a, a chunk has both an integer and a byte, then sure, fall back to uh, the same implementation we just saw, the, the one that uses an array of objects. So the trick is that contains only. And we did, we did a bunch of things. Um, we had the ability where chunks could sort of track the class tags of the elements um, that they got constructed with. Um, so that's that C.known element type thing. Um, we could fall back to linear scans, which is what we would do. So we'd say, if a chunk knows that its element type is, is byte, great. But otherwise, um, walk through every element and just do an is, is instance of chunk. And when you looked at like the way in which this known element type thing was implemented, it was like all of the dense chunks had a known element type. Anything with like lots of size had the, the known element type. The only things that didn't have a known element type were like empty chunks and singleton chunks. So that C dot for all linear scan doing like is instance subjects ends up not actually being that expensive. And the performance of this actually ended up working out quite well. Um, so if you used FS2 in production, I guarantee you, you ran this, this code. <clears throat> Unfortunately, Scala.js entered the scene. Um, I mean, fortunately, Scala.js entered the scene. But unfortunately for, for me, who thought I was being clever with this, um, this is instance sub check, uh, check um, we have a, a different number tower in Scala.js. And in particular, every number is an instance of byte. Every number is an instance of Boolean, right? And so when you would concat a chunk of any of those primitive types, <clears throat> that very first clause uh, in, in concat that in any case where it would say, you know, is everything in the, this chunk a, a byte, um, that would always return true for, uh, regardless of the, the primitive type that you're working with. Okay. Right. So the lesson there is that, you know, um, we were being too clever, right? We, we, we chose the wrong, um, <clears throat> the wrong approach on how to deal with that concat problem. So what we ended up doing was this option four. So it's sort of a combination um, of option two uh, and, and our, our original design. Um, so we're going to return a queue of chunks. 
first of all. Just create the QO chunks and don't worry about concatting at all. But then why don't we make another chunk constructor, data constructor, that can just reference a queue of chunks? Seems reasonable, right? Um, and even like index-based lookup, we can just kind of manage all the offsets ourselves. Like if you ask for index 25 and the first chunk is only 10 elements, we can sort of move over, um, you know, calculate the offset, et cetera. Um, so maybe that looks something like this. We have a class Q which references a Scala immutable Q, which by the way, Scala immutable Q is one of the most undersung um, collection types in the standard library. It's awesome, go use it. Um, but the Scala immutable Q of chunks, right? And then we also store uh, the total size of this chunk as the, Q, or as the individual elements are being added, right? So the size operation on the return chunk is still constant time. You can have lots of chunks in your chunk queue um, and you can still call size in like a bound on a, a while loop um, and have no performance concerns. We can add a bunch of, you know, constructors to this class right here. Uh, we have a, a prepend and a postpend constructor where it just adds a chunk to the queue and updates the size. Um, here we're, by the way, we're making this design constraint that our queue is never going to store empty chunks, uh, right? Otherwise, um, you know, we could end up with like maybe chunks with overall small size, but lots of elements in the, in the queue itself. You know, and then we have the supply operation, which just does all the index management I just talked about. Right? Um, so if you go to look up index i, then it first starts at the first chunk and says like, is index i in the, the, the bounds of the first chunk in the queue? If it is, great, return that element. <clears throat> Otherwise, recurse. Right on the remainder chunks in the queue up until the point where we find the right chunk, um, and then you know do a direct lookup in that chunk. Okay. This implementation then means we can go back and add that plus plus method to chunk that earlier we said we didn't want. Right, we didn't want to encourage folks to do concatenation, but now we've got constant time concatenation. Seems like you know this is a win all around. Um, and in fact, our implementation of uncons n ends up being much more straightforward as well, right? We don't even need to um, work with queues anymore, right? We don't have to manage our own queue of chunk. We can just you know, have an accumulator of type chunk O and just use our plus plus operation everywhere before that we were adding elements to a queue, right? Okay. But unfortunately, and by the way, this shift to production. Um, unfortunately, we have an issue. And the question becomes, you know, what is the runtime of that apply operation we just looked at? When you do the index-based lookup of apply, um, what's, the, um, uh, what's, what's the overall runtime of it? Well, let's consider two cases. If the number of the constituent chunks, the number of elements in that queue, is small relative to the total size of the uh, number of elements in the, um, you know, the, the sum of all those elements in the queue, right? Um, then our runtime is constant, right? Or effectively constant. But what if instead we fill the queue with singleton chunks, right? Chunks of, of size one. Well, then that recursive iteration you know, of, of an index-based lookup ends up being linear time, right? Because someone asks for index 10, you go to the first element and says, well, it's not in the first one, so move on to the second one, move on to the third one, right? But you're only ever progressing by one element at a time. Note critically, since we don't have empty elements in the chunk, I'm sorry, we don't have empty chunks in the queue, it's not worse than linear. If we allowed empty elements in the queue, then this could be um, you know, worse than linear. But since everything has a, at least size one, it ends up being linear time in this case. Okay, what does that do to for each, right? For each is, is linear in nature, right? Like we're gonna go through every element of, of the chunk. Um, but now each time through uh, the while loop, we're doing a lookup for an index. And we just said we have a worst case O of N uh, you know, linear time apply, 
so for each becomes quadratic, right? <laughs> when those number of constituent chunks in the queue uh, approach one, um, or the size of them approach one, uh, we end up with a quadratic for each. So one approach to fixing this is don't do index-based lookup. Okay, um, if we don't do a call to apply, and instead we override the definition of for each and for each with index on our queue class that we just created, providing specialized implementations, we can just say like for each over a, a queue of elements is really the same as for each over um, each individual chunk. And now this has restored the linearity of for each and for each with index. And then really what that means is that it's restored linearity to map, to filter, to collect, to all of the other operations that are built off of for each and for each within. So cool. Um, that, that also was shipped. Um, and this is a fine solution, by the way. There's, there's no, no gotcha on this one. Um, what's left, though, is that we have apply. Um, we have that lookup by index. And do we want to give up? on an efficient lookup by index? That really becomes the question. Um, and we don't. And so one of my co-maintainers, uh, Diego, came up with this idea. Um, to implement efficient, you know, effectively constant time lookup, what if we uh, you know, created this array of accumulated sizes and just binary searched it? Um, you know, finding the element that contains the index in question, and then, you know, do the, the offset calculation to, to return the, the direct element. Um, then uh, lookup becomes um, logarithmic. And so it, it sort of ends up looking like this. Uh, imagine we've got a chunk queue with five chunks in it, and we go to look up the element at index 20. Right, so the algorithm should search, do a binary search of this accumulated sizes array. Right, so start at 14 and look for the smallest index whose size is greater than the target index, or this, the smallest value whose size is greater than the target index. So in this case, it would start at 14, it would move to the right and find 34. And say, okay, 34, that index uh, is the the smallest potential uh, value. So we know that um, our target element is actually in the uh, corresponding index or is in the corresponding chunk. Okay. So we can go from 34 here up to this uh, chunk up here. Compute the, the offset and return the actual value. Um, the code you know, is a little bit complicated, so I won't go through all of the details. Um, but it, you know, one thing to point out is that we need to defer the computation of this accumulated sizes array up until the point where we actually need the lookup. Right? We don't want to do this on like every creation of a chunk queue. We're going to be constantly doing this linear scan across the elements in the chunk. Um, so we just use a lazy bound. We have this accumulated sizes uh, pair of arrays, um, you know, stored as a lazy bound on the immutable Q class. Um, when it's initialized, it goes through and computes all of those accumulated sizes. And then when doing an index-based lookup, effectively it's just going to binary search that accumulated sizes array. Um, there are a couple uh, interesting edge cases here, like um, accessing the very first element in the array you don't need to do all this, right? So we have a, a guard for that. And we say like, if you just want to index the head, let's just go and, and give you the first element of the first Q entry. And likewise, if you just want to index to the very last element in the array, um, we have a special specialized case for this. And there's probably you know, room for a little bit more boundary conditions, like the first few elements you could probably optimize. Um, but this is currently what's uh, in FS23. Um, cool. So what, what uh, does our runtime become now? Um, apply ends up logarithmic uh, based off of the constituent Q size. Um, 
The first one, the first call to apply has to do that linear scan of the elements of that queue, right? So if the elements of that queue is M, right? We get a, a linear scan of, a scan of M, and then we get the logarithmic search of M. Um, any subsequent lookup calls are just logarithmic. And so in, back in our worst case, again, where M is equal to N, where every constituent chunk has size one, um, this ends up as uh, N log N uh, runtime. Okay. Um, so I said a chunk is all of these things, but you know, we compromised a lot, right? We compromised on immutability. We compromised on um, strictness, right? Because we, we had that apply operation that didn't, uh, didn't return an option. Um, we, comp or we, we really ended up compromising on this notion of efficient index-based access. Um, you know, that we have this case where it's actually not linear anymore. Um, sort of close enough. Right? Um, and so when I was putting this talk together, I wanted to be careful to not imply that, you know, this was, you know, a, a set of decisions we sort of walked through one by one and arrived at what you see today. Right? Um, Rather, this was a long iterative process through many years, right? Through many use cases and different types of applications and um, you know, different uh, folks being involved and so forth. Um, lots of experiments, lots of analysis, et cetera. Even when pr um, putting this talk together, if you look at the, the issue numbers here, um, we found things, right? Like any, anytime I go to write a talk, I find something to fix. Um, so some of these higher issue numbers are things found in the creation of this talk. Um, so overall, I hope that was an interesting tour. Um, as a takeaway, you know, I would say when designing your own data types or designing your own systems, um, you know, I think it's important to identify the properties we're designing towards, right? And then measure our success uh, towards reaching those properties. But then also sort of have the awareness of like when those constraints need to be bent or changed or when the creation of a constraint maybe is no longer relevant. Um, and sometimes that's the hardest thing to do is to say like, this problem is a problem that doesn't need to be solved, right? I, I need to fundamentally change the way I approach the problem. So anyway, that's, that's all I have for today. I'm happy to uh, talk in the other channel. <laughs>